Hello and welcome to this week's episode. This week here in Australia it is Gifted Awareness Week. Now that's a week run by the AAEGT, which is the Australian Association for the Education of Gifted and Talented. And here at Our Gifted Kids, we love to support this week every May for two reasons. First of all, obviously, we want to raise awareness of giftedness. But we also love to support it because of all the great work that the AAEGT does and all of our state associations here in Australia, but of course, worldwide. We know we've got some really active state associations in the US as well. And these organizations are so important and offer so much to the gifted community. So for Gifted Awareness Week this week, we have a smashing podcast for you. It is our absolute delight to be welcoming Dr. Deborah Ruff to the Our Gifted Gifts podcast. And today we talk to her about the five levels of giftedness, which was her original book, which got renamed. <laughs> and we talk about that. But it's a body of work that we all love and cherish and feel very grateful that she undertook and contributed such amazing research to the gifted community. And she has written a follow-up book. So in the original book, there are a bunch of case studies of gifted children. And her follow-up book is a longitudinal study of where those children are now. Fascinating stuff. It was an absolute delight to talk to Deborah Ruff about it and see what she has learned from that process. I absolutely adore having guests like Dr. Ruff on the show because it's just such an opportunity to learn. And I was really like just soaking up all of her generous spirit and knowledge and experience in this episode. And what I really loved about this conversation with Dr. Ruff is the nuance that she brought to the conversation today and the different aspects of the five levels that we talked about, but particularly where I started drilling her towards the end about different aspects of assessment. It was a wonderful episode. I thoroughly enjoyed having Dr. Deborah Ruff on the show. Please, if you have not read her original book, Five Levels of Giftedness, already, it's an excellent book. But also keep an eye out for her follow-up, which I believe is coming out in you know bookstores near you very soon. You can pre-order at the moment, I believe, and there's plenty of links in the show notes to her work. It's a lovely way to support a great author and contributor to the gifted community. Please also check out what else is going on this week for Gifted Awareness Week. There's always lots of things online, but also locally around Australia. And if you're not in Australia, you can always access the Gifted Awareness Week blogs or online events. And if you love the podcast, leave us a review. Five stars will do. Or share with us why you love the podcast. If you have gotten a lot out of what we share here, investigate our podcast patron program, which is a really great way to keep us going. Thank you so much. I hope you love this podcast as much as I did. And let's get on with it. Let's hear what Dr. Deborah Ruff has to say. Hi, I'm Sophia Elliott. As a parent of three gifted kids, I'm here to talk about all things gifted. Because I've been isolated and uncertain, and I felt like that parent, then I found peace of mind, support, and my community. This podcast is about sharing that journey, actually parenting gifted kids, and connecting with advice and support. So we have everything we need for every member of our family to thrive. This is the Our Gifted Kid podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. I'm feeling very honored to introduce Dr. Deborah Ruff as our guest today. Deborah earned a PhD in test and measurements with a minor in learning and cognition at the University of Minnesota. She worked as a private consultant and specialist in gifted assessment, test interpretation, and guidance for the gifted for 30 years. She is the award winning author of Losing Our Minds Gifted Children Left Behind and possibly best known for her book, The Five Levels of Gifted, School Issues and Educational Options, which we have talked about on this podcast before. <laughs> and at the moment, Dr. Ruff is working on a follow-up to this book, and we're going to have a chat about that today. For more than 40 years, Dr. Ruff has served as a keynote speaker, top and conference presenter, and written extensively on giftedness. 
Welcome, Deborah. I'm absolutely delighted to have you on the show. I'm delighted to be here, Julia. Thank you. And so let's start with how did you first get into the gifted field? Right back at the beginning. Uh, it was my kids. Yeah. I, I was a teacher in elementary school before that. And I, I had my first child and quit teaching because I didn't see how I could do both. Yeah. But as it turns out, I just did more unpaid labor for the next half do full dozen years because yeah. I started to study giftedness. And like so many people who are undoubtedly in your audience, we saw some of ourselves in it. And so it became a journey for me, not just as the mother, but as the individual. And I went back to school. I already had a master's degree in administration and supervision, but that's not really my strengths because I'm much more of a delegator. <laughs> and and the idea of keeping people on track of my vision in an appropriate way, I could see it wasn't really going to work well for me. And I knew that if I did something more independent, mm -hmm. I could study it, share it, write about it, speak about it, and hope that I also made a living at it. But that wasn't my first goal. The goal was to share it. Yeah. That's so interesting. So many of the guests that come on the show, and I, I always ask that question, how did you first get into it? And I don't know, nine times out of 10, it's, yeah, my kids. <laughs> and, then, mm -hmm. and then we inevitably, like you say, go on this journey ourselves. And I can certainly resonate with that over the past five years or so. So you, you sought to sort of create this new path for yourself. And as we've already sort of discussed, you, you did a PhD and you've written a lot. By and far, I think the book about the, the five levels of giftedness has been, I'm not even sure what the word is. It's like a, you know, it's, for me, it's a real foundation of understanding giftedness. And so I know as a parent, when I found that book and I found your work, it really helped me make sense of my children and what I was dealing with and have some sense of a, a framework around that. Because what I was desperately grasping for at that time was like, how serious is this? <laughs> so how extreme is this? What exactly are we dealing with here? Like how much do I need to go into panic mode? Like this was early days. <laughs> Right. And it really but helped me. Didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. And it really helped me to, to understand what I was dealing with. And I, I'm assuming you hear that a lot from parents. Well, yes. And <laughs> yeah, what I also hear is that it's the relativity that they just didn't get. And they, they made mistakes. We all made mistakes because we didn't understand how different this child is compared to a different gifted child. Mm -hmm. And if you're fortunate or unfortunate enough to have more than one child, <laughs> you start to see they aren't all the same. Oh. And everything about them, personality, what sex they are, their moods, how you're treating them, everything starts to impact them. What teachers they get, they, they're just so many different things that make it a real stressful, problematic journey unless you feel you have support. Mm -hmm. And I should point out, Five Levels of Gifted is the same book as Losing Our Minds, Gifted Children Left Behind. Ah, oh, interesting. Yes, but what happened is it was such a great title, the first one, but no one knew what it meant. Yeah. You know, they would have had to read the book first to understand. Mm -hmm. And that's why I suggested we needed to change it. Mm -hmm. But it's 
problematic because it's hard to get people to understand. It's the same book. You don't need to get both of them. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. Because I, I was about to say, I hadn't read the second one, but now I know it's the same. I'm, I'm sorted. And, and which one did you read? Uh, I've read the five levels, the original. Right. That's um, the second. Yeah, oh, that's the second one, right. Yeah. But, and so yeah. Right. Yeah, and exactly and it was cover. yeah, and it was really it was a it was really pivotal for me because, like you say, I have three children; they are all very different, and 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 there is, like you say, no two gifted kids are the same. So it's very hard as parents to to kind of get a sense of like how hardcore we need to go with the advocacy and the support and the accommodations because our kids, I mean, my kids, they always just feel normal to me. You know, it's within our family context, they're all very normal. And so not having that sort of broader comparison, it was very tricky to see you know, where they kind of fit amongst their same age peers mm-hmm. and and it was really helpful. So perhaps we could start for those listeners that haven't read the books with what the five levels are. Would you be able to take us through them? Well, I'm a big <laughs> eater and even yeah. my own book, it's like, oh, <laughs> but the first level is what I call the conventional gifted that sometime sometimes are not even identified in school mm-hmm. because they're the, the smart kids, but they don't have the magic 98th percentile cutoff that a lot of schools use. And so they get overlooked and that's a problem because they are the average of the, the professional classes of our countries. <laughs> I mean, that is who the lawyers and doctors and yeah. leaders are in the, level one. Now they may be higher, but they, they need to be at least that to do those kinds of roles. Yeah. Yeah. And in school, if they are not figured into ability grouping and other learning groups that the kids are more alike for the lessons, they will be treated like average as far as the schoolwork. And that's a problem. And So level two is kids who have passed that magic line, which is not really, you know, it it isn't a real line. Yeah. (laughs) And I should mention my pet peeve as somebody who majored in test and measurement, that that magic line is, there's such a thing when you give IQ tests and ability tests of a true score. And that's what that ranges that they give you Mm -hmm. the true score is going to fall in a range that could be as big as three to four points on either side of the score the child got yeah but don't they don't pay attention to that with their magic cutoff in most stage in most situations so these are the highly gifted and some of them also can be into that exceptionally gifted realm in some areas but they are also conventional gifted. Everybody knows them. They're in all the classes, unless it's a very repressed atmosphere, high poverty or, and, and again, poverty is a trauma. And yeah. so trauma can suppress scores. So we can misjudge people and underprepare them when we have that kind of situation. But level three is borderline between we've still met all of them we've had them in our class but they are getting exceptionally to profoundly gifted there they're highly exceptionally to profoundly depending on their strength areas and i should tell your audience right now that when i used to give iq tests parents would ask me so what are you saying is my child's iq I said, well, in and out. (laughs) If it's not an even score, if it's a very lumpy profile, I don't want them to pay attention to the IQ. Mm -hmm. I want to pay attention to the different highs and lows Mm -hmm. so they can meet the needs of the child better. 
and they'll be very frustrated. And I say, you have to understand a single score does not give you nearly enough information. Yeah. And so I, I really feel strongly about that. If you've got a real balanced profile, then I, you can talk me into giving you the score. But it's in the report anyway, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, but anyway, level three is really highly gifted. And these are the kids who, if they get no special treatment in their early school years. And the thing to remember is almost all high schools start funneling the children by their preparedness to learn. Mm -hmm. So there is less and less trouble by the time you get to high school, unless you've refused to cooperate by the time you get there because elementary school was so bad. Yeah. And you've been destroyed by it, which I'm, I'm not kidding. Yeah. Some people, their personality types are such and their feelings are such that they just, no, I just want to finish this and get out of here. So level three is the last one that you can actually try to send to school as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and then level four and five are exceptionally to profoundly gifted and profoundly, profoundly. And mm -hmm. what that means and their scores, it depends on the tests. You know, that's what the levels of gifted book shows you. Because I've given yeah. this Bene LM, I've helped norm the Stanford Bene 5, the WISC 4, and the WIPSI 5. I might have those numbers mixed up, but they're the most recent ones. Yeah. And, and I really viscerally know what we're getting. Yeah. And I've taught over a thousand kids over the years. Yeah. I lose track. You know, please, I don't need to count that. <laughs> but the levels four and five, you can find some schools that will work for the four, like a real Montessori school, uh -huh. because they really do individualize. Mm -hmm. And then you should talk to other people you know who have kids that you think are levels three and four into being in the school, too. Because the more kids who are like your child, the better. Yeah. But by four, you still might find others like your child. <laughs> by level five, you're not going to. You know, they live somewhere else. They're mm -hmm. a different age. It's incredibly unlikely that you will have another level five in a class with your child during the first six to eight years of school. Yeah. Most of them have to leave for their own mental health and, and academic health early, early. Parents start coming up with very different ways to meet their needs because the school really can't. And the idea of attending a school for gifted kids who are that gifted, it's kind of problematic. I mean, it, it can happen, but it's mostly going to be levels two, three, and four in a gifted magnet school or private school, because mm -hmm. it's still that rare to have a five. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean they're one in a million. I had a conversation with my original publisher and editor, Jim Webb, Dr. James Webb, and we both agreed it was probably closer to one and a quarter million. It's just that they're spread out. Wow, as many as that. Yeah, but so many of them are failing. Yeah. Yeah, so my my current book, Longitudinal Result of as many kids as I could find from the Five Levels of Gifted book, they're all yeah. grown up. And I'm trying to answer that question of what went wrong and yeah. what went right. Because, what, for instance, one of my level five subjects, he did not get what he needed and he hasn't even gone on to university. And he was so smart, so smart. And so there are reasons why things didn't work for him, but yeah. not because he was smart. It was because of the way he was treated. Yeah. And it, it isn't that high intelligence makes you crazy. It's the way you're treated makes you crazy. <laughs> so, or functionally not doing well. Yeah. Yeah. So 
anyway, those are the five levels. And you really can find lists of those with lots of details and early milestones. And that's how I created it. It was after I looked at the milestones of children over the years and what they were like when they were born and what they were like when they were three months old and six months old and then a year and then two years, you know, and yeah. see what they are like. And then later we have scores and we see how those fit or don't fit. And it really is rather amazing how well the scores are in the range you would predict from those milestones. Love what you're learning from the Our Gift to Kids podcast? Why not become a supporter? The quickest way to do this is to leave a review. There's no need for an essay. Five stars will do. You can also say thanks with a one-off tip in the tip jar or become a regular supporter for as little as the price of a coffee per month. There are lots of different ways you can say thanks. Check out the link in the show notes or head to www.ourgiftedkids.com to find out how you can help. Yeah, that is really incredible. And that's one of the things I think I find most interesting is when you talk to parents about the traits that you include in the levels, when did they crawl or walk or talk or read or recognize letters and numbers? Those milestones, the physical milestones, as well as the academic milestones are right there from the very beginning. Even that sort of how alert were they after birth, (laughs) you know, and that moment. A friend of mine last year shared, had just had a baby and shared this photo and this baby was like less than an hour old and the eyes were bright and this, I swear this it, this newborn was smiling and I'm like, oh my God, I'm watching you. <laughs> I'm onto you already. It's just that alertness. And so it has always fascinated me that you can, it's a holistic thing. It's a whole experience phenomenon, giftedness and, and those traits and stories from parents can be a real indicator as to what you're dealing with. and. I know they've certainly helped me along the way as, as a parent, as I've been trying to quantify and really sort of figure out, because you always, am I imagining this or am I seeing things that aren't there and you're looking for something to, to compare it to and your, your lists that nut into those levels are really helpful in that regard. Why? Well, think- yeah, no, they are. And I imagine... I mean, like most lists, if parents are having a look at those, you know, children never tick every single box, but it's looking for a sense of, yeah, and this is where they're fitting. I've had, I, you know, when my book first came out, the one back in 2005, 2009, same book. Yeah, same book. <laughs> when that first came out, I, I read reviews. And I I went on listservs to see what were people saying. And one of the things that just drove me nuts is when people would fixate on one of the milestones and argue about it. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, but I I didn't get involved. I just felt bad. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, because you aren't going to have them ticking every box. I mean, even a level five isn't going to tick every box because... That isn't who they are. There are mm-hmm. other ways. No. Yeah. And plus, I have, I, I just, it, it was so important to me. I, all the books I read and I just soaked them all up, as you can imagine, for mm-hmm. about 10 years before I finished my dissertation. And which is my dissertation, which I'll give to anyone free, PDF it to you. It's highly gifted adults. And your journey to self-actualization. And these were not people I had worked with or tested. And the ones, some of them, I said, I think you should be in this because I knew them for one reason or another. And they'd argue with me. They, I'm not gifted. And I say, listen, trust me, I know you're gifted. But I finally would give them information about how they could see if they were gifted 
mm-hmm. if not, it actually, I mean, it's a funny thing because sometimes when you're highly intelligent and other people tell you you are, you think, ah, what do they know? <laughs> so you discount it. Mm-hmm. And that that's your proof you're not gifted. You discounted somebody telling you you are? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, they, there are tests they can take. Like, try and get into Mensa. It'll tell you if you're over the 98th percentile. They won't tell you your score because they aren't licensed to do that, which I think is silly. But anyway, they also, there's something called the Miller Analogies Test. And that's a good one for adults to study up on and take through a university online. Mm-hmm. And it, it's it got an excellently high score as far as a high ceiling. Ceiling. And, yeah. yeah. And you'll, I don't know how they score it now. I know they've changed the metric, but you will be able to then find online what is this compared to in IQ scores. Mm -hmm. And then you find out how far into the gifted range you are, which is, you know, that's all you need to know. You don't need to have an exact number. Mm -hmm. And it helps you figure out yourself more. And as you figure yourself out more, you will be a better guide for your children, I think. Oh, I think as well. Incredibly true. And it certainly has been my experience. And I would love to read your dissertation. I myself have most certainly been going through a positive disintegration over the last couple of years. I feel like I've come, I'm definitely coming out of it and more positive than disintegration these days. But it is certainly, a huge journey because, and I think just on a very basic level, it's some validation that we're not typical, you know, our experience of life has never felt (laughs) entirely normal. And it's just this validation of well, cause you're not typical and it's kind of like, oh, okay, what a relief, you know, like you say, just even at a basic level to acknowledge, regardless of getting into the nitty gritty of numbers, um, just to be open to that possibility that there's, there's something behind it. And I think it's the more I have learned about myself, the better parent I have become like just 10 times over. And it's a journey that thankfully my husband and I have been going on together with our kids and And I am, yeah, always encouraging listeners and parents to take a bit of time to to dig into those questions for themselves because Mm -hmm. it it will help you figure out what your triggers are with your parenting and some of your fears and concerns with your kids and their education and help you understand your children. And, And I think as well, if you can get some insight into the levels, you know, how kind of significant, it's not quite the right word, but I think rare, you know, rare, rare. How, how many people really mm. are at the same level as that child or yourself, mm-hmm. because it helps explain some of the times in your life where you just didn't fit and you didn't, you knew it, but you didn't know why. Yeah. Absolutely. And that sense of just desperate to find someone who I can talk about things to this degree. Absolutely. So I'm really interested then the follow-up work that you've done now with the the children that you started with are now very much adults. What was perhaps the most surprising or interesting thing that you came across in that research? Well, I'm still working on it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and I keep coming up with new things I'm surprised about. I almost didn't have a section on bullying in mm. my book. And I knew that had been covered enough about gifted kids feeling bullied sometimes. But I, I now have a chapter about sibling bullying. And peer bullying has been covered plenty, but sibling bullying hasn't. It's a recent research area. 
and people are trying to turn it into also a mental health, uh, a really important mental health issue because sibling bullying, not just in the gifted, but among all children is very, very high numbers, like more than half. And it has ramifications later throughout life. And so I, one of my editors actually suggested, you should ask about bullying. And I said, oh, okay. But I was thinking of the peer bullying in school. Mm. That's yeah. not really, he, he was thinking of that, but he was also thinking about in the family. Yeah. And that chapter was very hard to write because I had to learn it. Yeah. Most of the things I'm writing about, I really viscerally know and know from all my reading and experience. But this one, yes, I have experience, but I didn't know how to interpret it. And I'm not a therapist, so I didn't want to step on any therapeutic toes. <laughs> yeah. And so what, what I found is how common some things are, even among the gifted at all levels. And that's the thing that has really, the uniqueness is, it's sort of uniqueness, but I can tell you, you, you want an intelligent therapist. You want a guide, a coach, a therapist who is smart enough to be there with you, but they're trained and able to be even a little behind you in intelligence, but still know their topic and human nature. And I, I found one of the things that's common among gifted adults is they don't think anyone's going to understand them. And they, that's part of why they eschew therapy because it'll be a waste of time. Well, it isn't always. It, sometimes it is. And as the old columnist used to say, Ann Landers, she used to say, try a different one. Try a yes. different one. You have to stay with one that isn't working for you. Mm. And the issues of family are huge. And a good therapist can help you with family issues, whether you're gifted or not. And in our world, the developed world, most people who, who are dealing with issues of giftedness have access to therapy. They have access to books. They have the ability to work on themselves. And you are going to find that the therapists who are available had reasons for wanting to be in that role. They'll relate to a lot of what you've go been going through. And that's part of why they got into that field. Just as we get into the field of gifted, it's because, ah, this is an issue for my family, for me, for my teaching, for whatever it is. But it's, it's personal. We don't just pick out anything. We pick out stuff we're already interested in solving and finding more about. So what other, other things were? Oh, I thought actual parenting styles made more of a difference than I found they do. Okay. That's interesting. Tell us more about that. Yeah. Well, I went with the old Baumrim model, which is about authoritative, authoritarian, and yeah. missive. And mm -hmm. I added neglectful or not involved, as she does too later on. Yeah. And what I did is ask the adult children, how would you say your parents parented? And I gave them a link to read up on what those were. And no one wanted to badmouth their parents. It was fascinating because they'd tell stories about this and about that, but they always gave their parents an excuse like I deserved it or I was a difficult kid. And so it depends on their age, what you're going to hear. Mm. So there is an age trajectory of people finding themselves. Mm -hmm. Some people may be sooner, but there's a general, it's almost impossible to, to make great strides when you're in your early 20s. 
<laughs> and and so I've become much more attached to well, how old is this person? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I'm not talking about whether they need a cane. I'm talking about how evolved can they be by now. Yeah. And so the parenting styles did not measure up as much as the Myers Briggs styles. Oh. The, yeah, the I I was fortunate enough that I've always given the Myers-Briggs to the parents of my clients. Yep. And so I had all of their parents' information, and I had their childhood Murphy Myskyers, which not everyone likes a Murphy Myskyer because they say, well, you know, they're not really valid because they change. Hey, people change. <laughs> people change that's all it is we want to know what they're like at the time yeah and i think yeah. Murphy ice guy does a pretty good job and so i have charts in the new book showing the parents types the children's types and then what the children scored as adults and many of them did change mm -hmm. and you it's not hard to see and it, it's very interesting so let's see, there was something else that triggered in me. Oh, so one of the things that was I knew already from earlier research with my clients when I was writing papers based on what I was learning. And one of the things, the people who worry about their gifted kids the most are J judgers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they they have a view of what it should look like when their smart child is in school. Mm -hmm. And so if they have a P perceiver child, it isn't good. <laughs> Not a great yeah. match there. Yeah. So the numbers are, as more people read my force-fed information on personality styles, more and more parents are considering, well, maybe... Other children in their family are also needing different support in school. Okay. But J. Judger kids in school tend to do their work. They might think it's stupid. They might think it's a thing to do, but they do it. Mm -hmm. The P receiver kids, it depends on whether they're feelers or thinkers, how they deal with it, but they basically don't like to do it. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's really so, interesting. Yeah. And I do have an article out that mm -hmm. is, and it keeps recirculating it because I think I don't want to keep going through this. <laughs> yeah, I did, totally. I've written it already. Yeah. <laughs> Here, I'll send you the link. And it's about personality types in school. And yeah. yeah. So it's, and the thing is, there's a, you, I, I don't have a children's version available free on, the internet, but there is an adult version free mm -hmm. on the internet called personalitypage.com. Mm -hmm. And great. I love it. And so I, I gave the official MBTI during my working, working with clients days. And I do not do that anymore. <laughs> and I was, you know, I got the training and the licensing and yeah. the SE and it cost me money too to yeah. give the actual test and now i just refer people to personalitypage.com yeah and because they also explain it to you mm -hmm. so if you if you want to get something out of my article which i'd be happy to share yes, i mean that'd be great yeah yeah i mean basically i'm keeping my i i don't think i'm ever going to be totally deluged with emails from people but I, I'm on Facebook and I have a page there for five levels of gifted. That's mm -hmm. my professional Facebook page. And there's a website, five levels of gifted, just words, no numbers, mm -hmm. dot com. Thank you. And we'll definitely put all of those links in the show yeah, notes. So many places I want to go. I. I think what we've talked about in terms of the five levels and, and going through will be really helpful for our listeners and our parents. And, and I'll pop links in so that 
anyone listening can go have a look at those levels and get a feel for it and then refer back to what Deborah said about what you know, those children are likely to need in education because it is really helpful for, for us parents to get a, a sense of that. I feel like it would be remiss of me to have you on the show and not ask you more about assessment, <laughs> given your wealth of knowledge and what you've shared so far. I mean, I mean, we have chatted a bit about assessment and IQ and I don't know, I think, I think what I'm hearing from you is, I think something that, you know, a value I hold dear is assessments are incredibly helpful, you know, and unfortunately, if you think your child is gifted and you're on this path, the investment in getting your child assessed is a, is a necessary investment because it helps you figure out what you're dealing with. And because Every gifted kid is different and expresses that giftedness in different ways. And you can be very surprised at what those assessments come out as. And I can certainly speak from experience there amongst my three kids. I think we've been through four different assessments so far, trying to get a sense. One child has done two for for various reasons and probably only one of those has been a, a, a really sort of sound picture of that child. Another one uh, was a really good sense, but it was incomplete because the verbal component wasn't included because the child was speech delayed. And so, again, very helpful to see percentiles. And the other two assessments we went through were problematic for various reasons to do with personality and sickness on the day. And so having been through that as as a parent, I always encourage parents to go down this route. But the caveat is, you know, unfortunately you need to invest this time, energy and money. But but like you said before, it's, it's not about that IQ number. For me, it's about getting a sense of those percentiles and what we're dealing with to figure out what level, you know, where are we at with this child, but going into it, knowing that there can be all sorts of complicating factors. What have you seen around that in your work? And you referred before to that scenario where a parent's like, right, what's the IQ? And, and you're like, well, it's a spiky profile. There's actually more in this story than just the IQ. Maybe tell us a little bit more about those spiky profiles. Well, I want to go back to. Okay, yeah, please do. Talked about how helpful the percentiles are. Mm. And I want to say, yeah. Oh, you don't. Okay, tell me more. You're not into the percentiles. No, level one, for instance, Mm -hmm. has, it's kind of like the 90th to the 90th percentile to mm-hmm. the 97th, 98th percentile. Yeah. Because that, but that isn't a very big range, really. Mm-hmm. When you get to the 98th percentile, it's only four more points on most standardized tests before you're at the 99th percentile. Yeah. And so they, it's a truncated forced bell curve. Yeah. So You've got this range of numbers, but actually what you're not taking into account is the standard deviation within that. Is that what you mean? No. Nope. Nope. What I'm saying is you have to start guessing and intuiting what you have. Uh, Okay. After you reach a certain point, because it's it's not, even though I tested samples of gifted children, previously tested above 130 IQ and other tests, it's still puts all those children into 25 points on the test. No, 15, 15 points on the test. 15 to 20 points, that's it. Because they they top out. Now that doesn't mean an experienced gifted interpreter can't tell you more about what it means, but the percentiles cease to have meaning. The 99th percentile is the widest ability range there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet those too many people are still repeating old test scores 
for the ranges. Drives me crazy. None of them majored in test and measurement. <laughs> and yet they refer to an over 160 is exceptionally gifted and over 180 is, we don't have tests like that. Yeah. The I think lab- that's why I don't like the IQ number because yeah. when you read about it, there's such a variance and what, you know, and like you say, one's 170, profoundly gifted. And I think that's why for me, I liked the percentiles because I can kind of go, well, in that 99.9 range, you may well be anywhere from 140 to 170, but it, mm-hmm. it gives me a sense of you're at that very top end. And I think that's why I found that easier to reconcile than the IQ numbers because it can be old data, it can be different tests. You know, there's so much variability in what you might be reading about there. Well, the thing is, yes, please <laughs> teach me. Because there's the milestones actually tell you more. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. And I, I like a lot of mothers and some fathers, more and more fathers, bless their hearts. Most mothers, well, when I made the rough estimates of levels of gifted online assessment, which I can't afford to post, that's why it's gone. I don't have any funding. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it costs money to post a test like that. Yeah. And the man who helped me design it for parents to take it online. And it was as accurate as the WISC test and the Stanford Binet test. And I'm in, I talked to, you probably know her, Femke Hovinga uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, mm-hmm. She, her husband, and I have talked about my giving that to them in some way so they can post it. Mm-hmm. And her, from it she's much better at marketing than I am and uh, that was the problem people thought everything should be free and I'm not funded by a university so I I had no money anyway but I have lots of curiosity and lots of interest and so what happened was I had my uh, my my friend who actually was the parent of a level five client (laughs) and it's not what he does. I mean, he's just brilliant, this man. And so he was, we were setting this up because I knew what it should be. And he said, okay, so we'll have at birth and then we'll have one year, then we'll have two years. I said, no, no, no. We'll have at birth. We'll have three months, six months, nine months. And he, he was baffled. Why would we do yeah. that? I said, because it makes a difference. Yeah. And it is a time when you see clear differences between and among children and those milestones. Mm -hmm. And so, and then we went to 18 months and then 24 months. And after that, it was a few years. And then it, we didn't do it past age six. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for that is this is a purer form of what this child's like. You can skew results through practice. You know, the kid looks more brilliant simply because they've been trained to do more. But that doesn't mean they really are. It might mean they are, but we can't tell as easily. Same with trauma, you know, and poverty and that kind of thing. Some kids have caretakers instead of their parents and nobody's really paying attention to their milestones. That doesn't mean they aren't smart. (laughs) Okay. So all of these things make a difference. And percentiles, well, I'm posting my full articles and I'm writing new ones and modifying old ones on medium.com. Yeah. Yeah. You can read up to three free every month and the membership, which helps me, (laughs) the membership helps me, but it's also not very expensive. Mm -hmm. And so if you want, and I'm learning, I'm, there's so many good things on Medium. It's incredible. Yeah, it and, is good. Yeah. So I recommend that people look me up on Medium. As I said, the first three are free every month, even if you don't want to pay anything. 
or aren't able to pay anything. And I also, you can subscribe without paying, which just means you'll be notified when a new piece comes out. Mm -hmm. And so I'm actively doing that. And when I'm through with the book, I will write as long as I'm able. I'm able. Now, I'll just admit it, I'm going to be 74 in March. So, but my dad is almost 99. So, you know, there's a chance. Plenty of time, time yet. <laughs> he's very, he's really still very good at Jeopardy. <laughs> that, that, that's so, sad. you know, maybe. <laughs> but Medium is where I'm posting the full articles because mm -hmm. to have a platform costs money for me yes. and I don't, yeah. I'm not making any money now. Yeah. And so I have to be clever about how I share in a way that you can afford, you know, people can afford to be shared too. Nobody has to be charged, but if anybody is willing to be, that would make me able to do a few more things. Yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. And that's really interesting. So your experience has shown that a keen eye for the milestones can be very effective establishing a child's level of giftedness. Yes. And it, correct me if I've if I'm summarizing what you've said correctly. Where you you're frowning upon the percentiles is that that ninetieth to ninety seven percentile kind of being the last almost year. like. <laughs> Yes, that like one particular range, but then that 98th, 99th, so much being in those, in, you know, in that two percentiles, there's such a huge range within that, that you're feeling like you're not getting the accuracy of really determining the upper levels, particularly in like, if we're looking at your levels of what's going in, for example, in that 99th percentile. Yeah. Yeah. And Absolutely. Thing, I'm not affiliated on purpose. <laughs> I made the choice. I've never applied to be a professor. And and the reason is I wanted to write. I wanted to think for myself. Mm -hmm. I do tons of my own research and I read other most everyone else's research. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't have time if I had all those committee meetings. Yeah. And I also didn't want to be constrained by the fashions of the day as far as what was worth researching. Yeah, yeah. That's what universities do to you. You have mm -hmm. to get funding yeah. for a department and you have to have it be in areas. I mean, I'm pretty freewheeling and I didn't want to not be. Yep. That, that's so, right. And that's what you value. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not feeling sorry for myself. I love my life. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So tell me a little bit more then about the assessment piece that you had developed there with the milestones. Well, first of all, there are some things in the assessment questions that are, are like null, null questions. That means that they don't bear on the results. Mm -hmm. And part of that is to keep parents from gaming it because parents fill out the form about their kids mm -hmm. and what they see as important and valuable might not be what is the most important and valuable. Yeah. So I don't want to, and I don't want people to push anything unnaturally in mm -hmm. their kid. Yeah. So also, most parents who have kids in a young enough age range still aren't informed enough to cheat. <laughs> <laughs> and if the kids are young, you might you might actually remember the milestone. Oh. You you know you're more likely to remember. I had a, a quick look at at the levels before we chatted just to remind myself, and I was looking at them and thinking of my kids, and and sometimes it's kind of like. Oh, I don't remember when that happened. But then other things, you know, stick in your mind. So, yeah, it can be tricky. And it, it varies considerably with parents, mm -hmm. but it allows for that. It, and just like an IQ test, when the kid is mm -hmm. sitting there, when the yeah. child is sitting there, they can be pretty squirrely. And 
there are group tests, which are the ones they give in school where the whole class is there and somebody proctors mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And those are not considered quite as accurate. You'll see more flux between test administrations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I have a brother who is just as smart as I am. And he was in a lower rung of classes for about five or six years because, first of all, he was not a cooperative student. <laughs> and second of all, when he filled out one of the forms for the test, you know, with the little bubbles, he and his friend were racing to see who could fill them out and be done first. They did not read the test and fill out the actual questions. Yeah. And so score was artificially low. This can happen in group tests. Mm -hmm. In a test administered by a capable administrator, somebody trained in it, and it's best if you can find somebody experienced with high end, because otherwise they still aren't going to give you the interpretation you need. You know, they may say, oh, well, he can do anything he wants. That's not helpful. <laughs> no, that's not helpful. Yeah. And so anyway, what, what I look at is the individual tests, which ones are they? And if a good report has been written, it helps me a lot to know whether this person knew what they were talking about in my language. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And because if they don't get some of the nuance of what the scores mean and how the child received the questions, whether they enjoyed it, how they were, it really, for most gifted children, taking an individual IQ test is like fun. Yeah, totally. Because it's it's like being handed a box full of games and puzzles and problem solving issues. You know, I mean, it's fun and it's stimulating and they're worn out at the end because they've really focused and concentrated. And it's it's considered the gold standard to have the individual IQ test that's Wexler or Stanford Binet. And then the others are all offshoots. But like the rough estimates, I know that the Samo Finga Bemke Hoviga's site in the Netherlands, she's developed yeah. a test that tests for extremely gifted. And I yeah. suspect every bit as good as my levels of gifted one. It's just for a different group and an age range. Yeah. And it can be done, but it doesn't have broad application. Because we're looking at a specific group, but that's okay. The specific group needs it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The work they're doing is really interesting. She did a podcast on Unleash Monday with Nadja, who's a friend of the the show, and it was really interesting to listen to. Nadja, so Nadja Serigetti is the host of Unleash Monday, and I will put a link to that in the show notes as well. Really interesting conversation there about the work they're doing to to get that test for the that highly gifted area and and every now and then I I I, I you know hop onto their website and see what they're up see if they're doing it in English yet cuz when I first looked it wasn't in in English yet and hopefully they in, in good English there so they could do that yeah I know right it would be great to have that available and I want to I want to make a comparison a positive comparison between the yeah. work there two generations younger, two to three, than Linda Silverman, who yeah. started the Gifted Center in Colorado. Both Femkit and Linda are so good at running a whole program. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have the skills. I admire them both very much for this. And they, in the process, they have brought in other professionals and they have trained together and learned together. And that's what Femke's doing. That's what Linda Silverman did. And it it makes it really, I, I, I wish more people did that. And I wish I'd started earlier, but my life was a little crazy. I didn't start earlier. <laughs> yeah. But it, it is, it's okay. You know, I've, I've been making a contribution that matters. 
but they do really good work. And I, I just wanted to point out that similarity between them. But right now, I can't name another. Well, there are some other places, kind of, but they, there are some other places that also address more specifically the two E issues, the twice exceptional issues. And so their testing and screening really delves into that as well. I think Silverman's does too. And I don't. I don't. I I basically tell, used to tell people if I thought their child was unusually odd, I would let them know. <laughs> well, it's good to know. <laughs> good to be so, pointed out. But the thing is, I, I don't, I have absorbed the highly yeah. intelligent. Yeah. And I don't see them as odd. So, yes, <laughs> that's true. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I feel you there. Well, yeah. So, I'm um, trying to make clear. Some of these other things are only odd to other people. Mm -hmm. it, does that mean we need to fix it? Yeah, absolutely. Very good question. <laughs> um, Deborah, I really appreciated your time. I'm just kind of having a little look at the watch there. If you have time for one more question. I, I, okay, I, great. I, I, <laughs> Excellent. Because I could talk to you all day. I'm curious about your thoughts and insight into testing young children of like under five and I guess what's the question I'm asking is so my understanding is testing under five can be quite inconsistent in terms of the results that you might get because of their age and maturity and ability to sit the test and so it makes it uh, more difficult, I guess, to get a perhaps a clear picture. And perhaps in that early you know, age group, that's an opportunity for us to look more at the milestones as we've, as we've mentioned. But I just wondered if you had any particular thoughts about testing in those young kids. Thank you. <laughs> um, good, good. I thought you would. Fine. All right. So... It isn't that they might be squirrely and not sit for the test. It's that most children that young are that way, so they haven't made enough questions on the test for it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And that's why the child who is able to focus is going to get an artificially high score. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And so that can be very misleading to the parents. Yeah. And the school. What happens is the best thing is to not start your child to actual school too early anyway. So my, right now we don't have a lot of schools cooperating with my idea, <laughs> but I would prefer more of a Montessori type setting for the early years. And if you can't get that, you should get a good daycare or optional parent or grandparent or somebody who's going to allow the child to just be the naturally curious child they are. The academics are not what's important. Mm -hmm. Sitting down, most kids gifted above, I mean, level two and beyond, but even most level ones, they teach themselves to read from being exposed to the books that people are reading to them. They don't need to learn to read. You don't need to sit down with them and make sure they're learning to read. They will. <laughs> they just do. They just get it. And so it, it's a very curious thing that parents think and I was, I was guilty of this myself. I thought, well, he's so smart. He should be in school. And then they aren't dealing with what he's ready to do. So, or she's ready to do. So what would be better is not even starting school at all until age seven, if you can manage it. And I realize it's a problem when both parents work, but something, you know, you, you should try and do something that allows for the child to still just be learning at his or her own pace. And then if that isn't possible, you would want 
not to start school early. Kindergarten is still a fun place. <laughs> and let them be there. And then let them skip first grade. Uh -huh. And go on to second. But it depends on the level. And so I, my book, and you feel free if you'd like, my assistant about these things, Michelle, and I can give you an updated chapter uh, table of contents, okay? And people can see what's in there. Also, I discovered my first book. You can read up to 50 pages of it online at Amazon. Mm -hmm. And you'll, it'll be like that when the next book comes out too. And so mm -hmm. it, it'll help you see some of these topics that help you make decisions about the very mm -hmm. earliest years, okay? Mm -hmm. But testing too early, you shouldn't test before seven if you can help it. Yep. And so, so the challenge there of testing early is that possibility for like a false positive because it can be skewed towards those children who have that focus, that ability to actually focus on the test and perform. Yeah. And those children who you know, don't have that focus or are are you know, still quite squirmy, there's sort of not enough in the testing to allow for this, like the squirminess, for lack of a it's more technical not word. Squirminess. It's not really no? this. Okay, help me understand. Test writing. The test writing yep. does not have enough questions in yep. the early range for the more intellectual advancement uh, of a kid. It's yep. just items that would really work for the typical kid. Yep. They, they so aren't... This, the, the questions don't have a high enough seal. Like the, the questions aren't stretching the kids enough. So they're not they don't stretching. Have, they don't have a high enough starting point. Yeah. I'm, you can, you see on the, mostly they would be given the whipsy. Yeah. And the whipsy only goes to age six. But if you wait until age seven, you can take the full whisk the Wexler test, and that is actually better. Mm -hmm. The Wipsy tends to over-test the young gifted kids. And that's, that's a problem because you might be led to believe your child should be doing this, whereas maybe this will be good. Yeah. And, it, and besides, when we are young enough ourselves to have kids young enough, we aren't advanced enough in our own learning and self-development to settle down mm -hmm. and not push things. <laughs> yeah. And especially if you're a J judger. Yeah. And as I mentioned, it, it, it tends to attract J judgers. Mm -hmm. And and they they know what's best. They know what's right. And I was a J judger at that time myself. Mm -hmm. I'm not anymore. <laughs> And but it took a lot of work not to be. Not that I was trying not to be a judger. I just became so much more aware when no one else is judging you, mm -hmm. and you're free to really be your real self. There are more P perceivers out there. Mm -hmm. mm. So that's what I'm finding. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. Thank you, because there, you know, as you know parents are needing to go through this assessment process earlier and earlier to get into gifted programs earlier. Oh. And so it is quite challenging to, to ensure that we're picking up the gifted kids. Yeah. You know, they're not falling through the cracks. And, and it sounds to me, you know, the best we can do is really find a tester who has that intuition about giftedness. So they're, they're doing the test, albeit on a young person under seven, but they've got a degree of, they know what other things perhaps to look for within that and, and have that insight to be able to pick that child as well. One of the things, if you want early entrance to some mm. program, there, I think it's Stanford Binet 5. I can't remember for sure right now, but I think that one, you can, they only require certain subtests to yep. see 
if the child is ready. And that's not so bad. It doesn't mm -hmm. give you the picture, but it can get your child into the program. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, does will the program fit your child anyway? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I would like to I would like to see schools not be based solely on your age. Oh, hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> and the person who wrote who was behind writing the Otis Lennon, the Olsat, I think that's the one. He out of the University of Iowa, that was a very popular group test. Mm -hmm. And still it is. He said in his years of doing this, and he also wrote achievement tests. And he said, by first grade, year one, not kindergarten, year one, the typical same aged mixed ability classroom already has 12 grade equivalencies of achievement in it. And yeah. that's that's the the fallacy, the the folly of grouping kids by age for academic learning. Now you can group together for art class, for recess, mm -hmm. for lunch. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't want to have children not be exposed to the range. Mm -hmm. But not in math class if math is their strength. Oh. Yeah. It's this book is turned into more than 300 pages. And it's because, well, I better put this in there. I better put yes. that in. There. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can't wait to read it. And I just appreciate your time today. And thank you so much for talking to us. It's been an thank absolute you. delight to pick your brain. And I, uh, I, I'm so pleased that you did. Thank you so much. Okay. I hope I and meet you someday. I would really love that. It was an absolute pleasure. Have a lovely evening and I'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye-bye. If you enjoyed this episode and it inspired you in some way, I'd love to hear about your biggest takeaway in the comments. For more episodes, you can subscribe. And to help others find our podcast, please leave a review. You can find show notes and more resources at ourgiftedkids.com. And connect with us on Facebook and Instagram. See you in the same place next week.